Uh, good morning, everybody. We, we start the second part of the summer uh, session. Uh, we have uh, given an introduction about uh, efficient systems, and uh, our ambition now is to look at all the existing efficient uh, power producing systems as well as the ones on the uh, drawing boards. So, in that case, we'll share uh, the screen. Uh, you can still interact with the uh, TAs uh, uh, within the chat room, uh, even during the session in term. Uh, all right, so uh, we uh, go to our web page here and uh, we start by looking at uh, the two main uh, reactor systems in operation today, uh, the pressurized water reactors and the boiling water reactors. Uh, we'd like to compare both of them. Uh, they have similar uh, kind of design properties, but they have also uh, have uh, differences. And uh, we already identified the engineered safety features in the one of the previous chapters uh, on the nuclear reactor concept and thermodynamic cycles. Uh, from there, we'll move to uh, eventually uh, four generation reactor concept, the uh, reactor concepts that are on the drawing boards uh, today. Uh, so we start with pressurized water reactors. Uh, and uh, an example uh, is that uh, system shown here in uh, Japan. And you could see that is the Ohi power yes. station complex. Uh, built uh, along. Uh, yes. You're not sharing your screen. I'm not sharing the screen. Okay, let me go back and share the screen. Thank you for pointing that out. Oh, boy, it is all messed up here. Um, we are sharing the screen now. <coughs> it seems that we had to go through that process uh, with Zoom here today. So today, again, we are going to deal and cover the two topics of the pressurized water reactor uh, designs as well as the boiling water reactor designs as, as many other designs that we can uh, uh, access. Uh, an example of a pressurized water reactor uh, is the Ohi power station complex. Uh, that would be uh, in Japan. You could see there we have four units, one, two, three, four, along the ocean, so it is cooled by water from the ocean. And parallel to the uh, containment structure where the reactor is positioned inside the structure there, we have the turbine halls. This, uh, these two units have their own electrical uh, island, as it's called. This would be called the nuclear island and would be electrical island right here. Uh, the uh, uh, Ohi power station, as you could see, is built uh, way above sea level. So in contrast to the Fukushima uh, reactors that were built uh, uh, very close to the sea level, they were not flooded by the tsunami. And uh, uh, this is a design feature that was beneficial. Uh, and it also points out that uh, the flooding accent has become one of the main accents that we worry about in nuclear power uh, generation. Uh, inside the containment structure, uh, with a door shown here with a standard man, you find huge components of a pressurized water uh, reactor. You find a pressure vessel shown here. Uh, inside the pressure vessel is a core that contains a reactor fuel, uranium dioxide in that case as a ceramic. On top of the reactor core, you'll find control rod drives that would uh, insert uh, into the core, the control rods uh, controlling the power level, as well as shutting or starting the chain uh, reaction. Uh, the fuel uh, is cooled by one 
two, three, four coolant pumps. And you could see here we have redundancy. It's not just one uh, coolant pump. And another level of redundancy is that we have two steam generators. So the coolant pumps circulate the coolant from uh, the uh, top here of the reactor core to the bottom in an annular region called the calandria. Uh, and uh, it, it's a, 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 a a toroidal region, the water goes to the bottom, rises, extracts the heat from the uh, uh, fuel, uh, and then uh, circulates it to those heat exchangers. Uh, those heat exchangers uh, would have internally U-tubes. Uh, those U-tubes circulate the water back and forth into the reactor core. The water is not allowed to uh, boil in that case. and uh, a component that is shown here is what's called the pressurizer. The pressurizer uh, generates a bubble of steam on top of the coolant and distributes the pressure all over the core. And I'll show you later how we can control the pressure of the reactor by controlling the bubble of steam inside uh, the pressurizer. So in essence, in the uh, pressurized water reactor, by the name itself, uh, we do not allow the water to Boil. We pressurize it, same as happens in the radiator on a car. The steam uh, bubble on top of the radiator pressurizes the water in the radiator, doesn't allow it to uh, boil uh, in that case. You notice here that we have a lid on the top of the reactor with a hoist uh, uh, access, uh, having access to it. You remove all those bolts here on the lid. You uh, raise the lid, set it on the side, and then you have access every year or a year and a half to the fuel, uh, take the, uh, uh, extract the spent fuel out and then replace it with new fuel. There is, the refueling happens every year and a half. So that's unlike uh, uh, coal power stations, for instance, uh, you need uh, to continuously feed coal, 100 car trains almost every day for the same amount of power. Uh, the U-tube, the heat exchanger is typical of that design. You could see here the tubes taking the shape of an inverted U. Uh, the water is, uh, they're immersed in water. The heat is exchanged between the U-tubes and the water. There now is the steam produced. The steam is produced not in the core, but in the heat exchanger or the steam generators. It goes through some drying equipment and then up exits the containment structure to the turbine hull shown earlier. Notice this is a marveling technology. These are the huge components uh, shown here by an access hatch to the containment structure uh, with a standard man. This is uh, shown to size uh, uh, in that case. Uh, we want to look at the different uh, components. First, we look at the power loop, uh, the core, uh, uh, is uh, fed by one, two, three, four, not shown, a uh, coolant pump. Uh, a pressurizer is connected to uh, the tubing and uh, that controls the pressure of the system. Uh, the control rods are from the top inserted into uh, the core. For redundancy, we don't use a single steam generator. Uh, a minimum of two is used uh, typically in those types uh, of uh, reactors. Uh, let's look in more detail at the components. Uh, this would be uh, the core here, uh, the pressurizer, uh, the heat exchanger, U-tube. There, there is another uh, uh, one through type of steam generator. I'll show you its design as we go along. Uh, the operational temperature is in the range from 557 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the average temperature is 587. Uh, this would be the inlet temperature. This would be the exit temperature from the core of the reactor. You notice a large temperature drop from 618 to 540 uh, for the steam uh, generated in the steam uh, generator. It goes now to a high pressure turbine, uh, expands, uh, rotates the blades of the turbine, uh, uh, goes to a, uh, a dryer, then a low pressure turbine on the same shaft uh, and the same shaft on the same shaft of the high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine. We place an electrical generator that generates electricity that goes to uh, the grid. Uh, because of the thermodynamic cycle, we need to uh, establish the flow system. So we 
have to condense the water so that the exit of the <clears throat> low pressure turbine, we go to a condenser uh, where cold water from a cooling pond, a lake, or the ocean, uh, 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 or the cooling towers, as we'll see in the next chapter, uh, cool the water, and condense it, and it's pumped back again with uh, feed water pumps to the steam generator inside the containment structure. Uh, uh, the reactor vessel uh, is uh, a marvel of technology. It has uh, very thick walls. Uh, it's either made by forging uh, steel or uh, uh, forging parts and then uh, uh, welding them together using explosive welding. It's a, it can reach, reach 10, 10 inches in uh, thickness. Uh, you could see here the control rods being inserted from the top of the core. This is the lid of the pressure vessel with bolts that would be removed for refueling uh, fuel into the core. From the pumps comes the water here as follow the arrows. It goes through uh, a, a, an annular region to the bottom, is uh, distributed through nozzles, uh, extracts the heat and exits through uh, pipes back again to the steam uh, generator. Uh, the nozzles there at the bottom have an interesting function because we'll see later that the power distribution in the core peaks near the center. So in that case, you want more coolant to go through uh, the center uh, than near the periphery. And uh, it also affects the fuel management because the fuel in that case, because more power and more fissions are occurring near the center of the core, you'll find that fuel management processes uh, where uh, the fuel from the center is moved to the outside and no fuel is uh, brought in into the center. That is called a uh, in-out kind of uh, fuel management process. So uh, the refueling happens, as I suggested, every year to a year and a half. Uh, if you look at the core from the top, you'll find a very thick pressure vessel taking a pressure in the case of the uh, pressurized water reactor of 2000 uh, PSI uh, pounds per square inch absolute. Uh, in the center of the core, you'll find now channels. Uh, those channels would have uh, uh, fuel, uh, uh, fuel bundles inserted into the channels. And the control rods are, would be placed in those channels that have the crosses uh, shown right here, in addition to instrumentation. Now, the pressure vessel is made out of steel, and uh, neutrons are generated inside the core of the reactor. So the neutrons can interact with the steel, the steel and cause radiation damage in it. So we protect that outside vessel with an inner vessel. It is misnamed the thermal shield. It's a shield against maybe some gamma radiation, but its real function is to absorb the neutrons, it contains boron. Uh, it uses boron uh, steel. Uh, I call it the core cage barrel. Uh, that is a thermal shield in that case. It protects the outside uh, a vessel from being embrittled because with radiation damage from the neutrons, you generate uh, vacancies and interstitials and that can turn it uh, brittle. So that is more like a protection for uh, against neutron irradiation by the neutrons from uh, the core uh, itself. Uh, let us look at the fuel. We said that uh, each one of those circles in the center of the core contains a fuel bundle. Uh, shown here, typically for a pressurized water reactor, it's an array of 17 by 17 fuel rods. Uh, the uh, rods or cans or cladding, as it's called, uh, contains little pellets of uranium uh, dioxide, and uh, they are separated with steel separators, you could see here, uh, so that the coolant coming from the bottom, exiting from the top, extracts the heat, but uh, prevents the rods from touching uh, each other and directs uh, the flow uh, of the coolant in that case. Some of the channels uh, would have uh, a spider kind of web uh, uh, in, uh, insert of uh, the control rods. So the control rods fill up some of those holes here where the fuel elements, as I said, 17 by 17 array of uranium dioxide fuel in uh, the rods. Uh, each one of those rods contain a small pellet, uh, one centimeter, maybe 0.185 inches uh, in diameter. 
of uranium uh, dioxide. Uh, the fission process occurs there, heat is generated, and then you end up with a distribution in the temperature that peaks near the center of the fuel. The temperature peaks near the center of the fuel, uh, comes down, goes through the cladding. Before it goes to the cladding, it goes through a gap that filled up with helium. Uh, helium in that case acts, uh, has three functions. One function is it acts as a thermal bond of, for the temperature to move through the helium from the uranium dioxide to the cladding made out of an alloy of zirconium. Uh, uh, second, uh, it, uh, uh, at the time of manufacture, uh, it can check for any kind of uh, leaks occurring uh, 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 when the fuel rods are welded from the top and, uh, and the bottom. Uh, uh, the temperature now uh, 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 distribution drops uh, from the center to the outside of the cladding where the coolant comes in and extracts uh, uh, the heat. Uh, the operational characteristics of PWRs are common to most existing PWRs today. This table shows us uh, the characteristic of a typical PWR design. Uh, uh, this one, uh, as I suggested, operates at very high pressure, 2,250 pounds per square inch absolute, hence the name pressurized water reactor. The thermal output compares this to the thermal output of the Chicago pile number one. It was one half of a watt of power. Here we are talking about 3,800 gigawatt or megawatt. Uh, this is a watt, mega is million. And uh, if you say 3.8, that's giga, that's billion watts. And we designate it with the designation TH, thermal. So this is the thermal heat that a typical PWR would generate. Uh, to establish the heat flow, as we suggested in one of the previous ch chapters, uh, we have to close the thermodynamic cycle by rejecting some heat to the environment to create the, uh, the cold sink for the heat. And in that case, the efficiency of the system would be in the range of uh, one third, uh, typical of boiling water reactors using light water as a coolant. So in that case, it's almost, if you divide that into uh, 33 uh, into one third, that is about uh, 1000 megawatt electrical. We replace that TH here for thermal by small e for electrical power. Uh, the enrichment of the fuel, remember that uh, we suggested that if you want uh, to take advantage of the use of uh, uh, light water, uh, because we know its physical properties, it's cheap, it's available, uh, we need uh, to uh, enrich uh, the proportion or the enrichment, uh, the proportion of uranium-235 in the fuel. In natural uranium, uh, the uh, uranium-235 is only 0.72%. You could see here that uh, there are three different enrichments of the fuel, 1.9%, uh, 2.4%, and 3%. Sometimes it goes from 3 to 5%. Uh, enrichment uh, in general. The inlet temperature typically 565 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the temperature rise is not very high. It's only about 60 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, the maximum fuel temperature though can reach 3,420 degrees Fahrenheit uh, uh, in general. Uh, I would like you to compare this later on with the same, uh, 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 these are called the tech specs or the technical specification of the pre pressurized water reactor to the technical specifications of the boiling uh, water reactor. You'll find that uh, many characteristics are the same except for the pressure here. In the boiling water reactor, uh, we operate at half the pressure of the uh, pressurized water uh, reactor, as we'll see. So we'll have a similar table for comparison uh, later on. Uh, the flow diagram uh, of the uh, thermodynamic cycle of a typical pressurized water reactor would be shown here. Uh, this is half the cycle. Think about a mirror image of that cycle here on the right, another one on the other side. Uh, uh, just to get an idea again about the temperature, uh, operational temperature in degrees Celsius, that's only 322 degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, make note of uh, in your mind of that uh, uh, temperature level 322 uh, compared to what we'll talk about later in the high temperature gas cooled reactor 
where we reach very easily the 1000 degrees Celsius. Hence, uh, it will have a higher efficiency uh, as well. It provides us with uh, 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 applications like the uh, dissociation of water into hydrogen and oxygen uh, for fuel cell applications that are not possible with the pressurized water reactor and the boiling water react. All right, in the pressure vessel, we have a reactor coolant pump shown in the diagrams earlier. It pumps a very large volume of water. We have four pumps in that case uh, into a heat exchanger. And uh, well, not shown in that diagram is a pressurizer. The water is kept under uh, 2000 uh, PSI pressure. So in that case, it doesn't boil. It goes to the heat exchanger. The heat exchange happens, steam is generated. It goes to a high pressure turbine. Uh, after it expands in the high pressure turbine, it goes to a moisture separator, to a reheater sometimes, and then it goes and expands back again in a low pressure uh, turbine. The high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine are connected on the same shaft to our electrical generator. And then this is connected to the grid where electricity is uh, transmitted long distances first, and then uh, its voltage is decreased into distribution line from transmission lines to distribution uh, lines. Uh, the water out from the low pressure turbine co goes to a condenser that it co is cooled by an outside source of cooling, a pond, a lake, uh, a cooling uh, towers. And in that case, the steam exiting from here now is uh, condensed into a liquid. A condensate pump pumps back the steam to a feed water pump back into the steam uh, generator and the cycle continues. To increase the efficiency, we uh, suggested that uh, we can bleed steam from the uh, turbines, from the high pressure turbine. You could see here some steam is taken into a high pressure water heater. It enhances the cycle efficiency. There is also steam bled from the low pressure turbines into a low pressure feed water heater. After the steam is condensed there, it is not shown here, but it's returned back into the feed water. So this is what's called the regenerative uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, cycle for the pre uh, PWR. We mentioned the pressurizer that meant, uh, controls the pressure inside the, uh, uh, the, the coolant uh, circuit. Uh, it's uh, really connected here to the, through the piping and it contains water, uh, the water, <laughs> <laughs> the water level is not shown uh, right here, but it's basically electrical heaters that the operators control. If you uh, 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 run the heaters, you boil the water, you form a bubble of steam, and the pressure of the steam is communicated to the rest of the uh, reactor. Uh, now, to increase the pressure in the reactor, obviously, you si uh, simply turn on those heaters, the steam uh, bubble is formed, the pressure increases. If you want to lower the pressure, uh, you have some uh, nozzles, a spray nozzle at the top of the pressurizer. It sprays water. As it sprays water, it condenses the steam or quenches it, and uh, the pressure can be reduced. Like any pressure uh, equipment, like a pressure cook uh, cooker uh, in a kitchen, uh, we have to protect the uh, components. So we have basically safety relief valves that are, so this is a relief nozzle, a safety nozzle. And an interesting aspect of the Three Mile Island accident is that one of those nozzles opened up, released the pressure as required from the safety perspective, but did not recede itself back again. And there was no indication to the operators that that valve had opened up and did not receipt, the stem of the valve did not receipt uh, itself. So it, uh, it ended up that the pressurizer filled up with water, the water escaped from that safety relief uh, valve and the operators lost control of the pressure of their uh, reactor. Uh, that was the case of the Three Mile Island. You can read about it, a full chapter here. Uh, the YouTube steep generator is shown right here. Uh, the coolant comes in from the bottom goes through a whole bundle of uh, uh, tubes uh, shaped uh, in the shape of an inverted U and exiting back again. And those tubes are immersed in water. 
This is where the steam now is generated in the pressurized water uh, reactor. The steam goes through some drying equipment. Uh, it simply gives the steam a, a centrifugal motion. So the droplets of steam uh, fall back into uh, the heat exchanger and dry steam is sent to the turbine. You want dry steam to the turbine because if you have uh, small uh, droplets of uh, water with the steam, uh, the blade of the turbines uh, can reach the speed of sound at their tips and uh, that would erode the surface of the turbine. Hence, you have that dry uh, drying equipment on the top of the steam generator. Uh, that type of steam generator, the U-tube is uh, primarily used by manufacturers like uh, Toshiba and Westinghouse, but you can also use a once-through type of steam generator shown here by uh, uh, another manufacturer, Combustion Engineering, where the steam flows in only one direction, no U2. It allows you to superheat the steam, hence you can reach much higher temperatures. Uh, 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 it, it is some kind of uh, uh, a choice of the utility to pick up uh, and the architect engineer, in fact, to choose what type of generator they want. Uh, the coolant pump that circulates the coolant, remember we have for redundancy, uh, two of them as a minimum, sometimes it's four of them, uh, as well as uh, a minimum of two steam generators and or uh, four steam generators. So it's a matter of uh, uh, redundancy to provide, of course, safety so that uh, uh, if you have only one steam generator and one pump, uh, the system would not be reliable in its operation. Uh, the pumps here uh, are designed to circulate uh, a liquid, obviously most pumps do that. They are not very effective in circulating a mixture of a steam, two-phase mixture of steam and uh, water. And that caused vibrations in the Three Mile Island accent. The operators uh, didn't want to lose their pumps, so they shut the pumps out and the cooling of the core uh, was not uh, provided for the decay heat. And we mentioned that nuclear reactors have an interesting property in that uh, uh, if you shut down the main fission reactions, the fission products from the fission process continue generating heat for a small period of time. Initially, about six to eight percent of the fission power, and you have to cool them uh, even after you shut down the main fission uh, reaction. And if you don't, uh, or if you don't succeed in doing it, you get an accident. And that was been common in the three main accidents uh, that. Uh, happened in the nuclear industry, the Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, as well as the uh, Fukushima accident. They were all related to having to extract that decay heat and the failure to do it destroyed uh, the reactors in that case. Uh, this uh, was the American design of the pressurized water reactor. Uh, there is a Russian design uh, designated as VVER, Vodo, Vodianoi, Energetsky reactor. Uh, shown here. The design is very similar to uh, the one you have in the United States with a much more elaborate control rod uh, drive system from uh, the top. Uh, typically, it's a 1,000 uh, megawatt electric of uh, power design. We'll see some new designs that the Russians are uh, pro promulgating uh, uh, and selling it to the rest of the world. So this is the AES 2006 Russian newer uh, design. You could see the feed water heaters here, the reactor coolant pumps, uh, and uh, the steam uh, generators. Uh, uh, another uh, part, uh, uh, show of the design is a small uh, power unit, uh, 300 megawatt electric. You could see the containment structure around here, and uh, it is basically a pressurized water reactor similar to the American uh, design. Uh, this is again the VVER 440. Uh, uh, this is the Russian PWR. The same uh, principles apply, but uh, the containment just designs are uh, slightly different in that case. Well, we mentioned the containment. So what is the containment? We suggested that the containment uh, structure is part of the engineer safety uh, features uh, that uh, try uh, uh, to contain any release of radioactivity from the environment. We suggested that for the pre-pressurized water reactor, uh, the uh, engineer safety features consist of those accumulator tanks that contain 
uh, water under nitrogen pressure. If there is a depressurization of the system and you get depressurization, if some of the piping breaks down, say as a result of an earthquake, so that su extra supply of water is pumped into the core to provide uh, cooling. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, this is a concrete structure. Now this is the uh, symbol uh, in uh, drafting for concrete. Uh, six feet thickness concrete. It is designed to take a direct impact from a Boeing 747 to protect the internals of the reactor uh, itself. Uh, the real containment is not the concrete. The concrete is acting as a biological shield for the personnel against radiation, neutron radiation and gamma rays from the reactor itself. The containment is a steel liner here at the bottom where if steam is released inside the containment structure, we have a spray that uh, would spray the steam and condense it to a sump at the bottom of the reactor uh, of the building that is cooled and uh, uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a heat uh, exchanger uh, in that case. There are many different types of containments. Uh, this uh, shows here another type of containment that's called the dry ice containment. Uh, you find here that uh, in the case, again, of a piping breaking down, you still have the accumulators obviously there, but uh, there is a refrigeration system that has, uh, that produces uh, ice uh, that is stored inside the, it's that the steel uh, part of the containment, the steel shell. And if uh, in that case, any steam is released in an accident, uh, the pressure is uh, decreased by, of course, the steam melting the ice. Some of these reactors operate today in the United States. Uh, I would like to emphasize that the containment structure for the pressurized water reactor uh, is not the concrete itself. Uh, this is a biological shield and a protection of the internal parts of the reactor, the steam generator, the core of the reactor, the pumps, the accumulator tanks, and so on. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the steel shell is really uh, where the containment is done. The concrete structure is more like a biological shield <clears throat> and a protection against the internal of the uh, reactor. Uh, it is not, uh, uh, if the steam is released inside the containment structure, it is a steel structure. And if it is not quenched, eventually the pressure increased by the steam would leak the steam, which would be uh, mixed with radioactivity to the environment through any penetrations, like you have cabling that comes in for the control systems and measurement systems. And uh, you have also piping that comes in uh, with a feed water heater and exiting uh, with the steam. Uh, this shows us uh, again, one of those ice condenser type of uh, uh, containment uh, structures. And you could see that uh, the ice condenser becomes part of the uh, containment system uh, uh, in general. Uh, we listed earlier in the, the previous, one of the previous chapters, the uh, existence of those engineer safety features. Uh, you'll find that there are extra cooling systems on land-based reactors. Obviously, the ones that are on nuclear submarines have the oceans uh, to cool them, but on land or land-based reactors, we have the accumulators containing water under nitrogen pressure. We have a high pressure injection system uh, this operates at around 100 uh, barometric uh, or uh, atmosphere pressures. Uh, the low pressure injection system, uh, this is pumped at a low pressure at 30 atmosphere. Obviously, if you want to inject, uh, if there is an accident, the reactor initially is at a high pressure, uh, 2000 PSI, so you need a pump that can generate high pressure. But pumps that generate high pressure can only have a very small flow rate or a throughput. So uh, after you, the system is depressurized by the operators uh, from, the pre the, from the pressurizer, then they can operate a low pressure injection system. And in that case, they can bring in lots of uh, a large flow rate to cool the core of the reactor as well. Uh, and this act, uh, the three of them act in addition to the containment spray system in general. Uh, the existing uh, reactor plants, PWRs, are 
undergoing some uh, form of uh, uh, improvement and uh, basically it's a kind of evolution. Uh, so let's look at some of the designs that uh, are available. Uh, you find that uh, uh, companies uh, in that uh, domain uh, collaborate with each other. For instance, we talk about a, uh, the US uh, advanced uh, pressurized water uh, reactor or the advanced pressurized water reactor uh, this is some kind of collaboration between uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries from Japan, uh, and uh, 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 actually it is uh, Mitsubishi building it right now for uh, Texas-based uh, 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 nuclear uh, power plant. Notice that this reactor uses a very uh, high power, 1538 megawatt electric, so it's taking advantage of the economies uh, of scale, uh, and uh, the larger the size of the reactor, the uh, least uh, the component in the uh, fuel or, or the energy uh, uh, attributed to the capital uh, costs. You find here that here is are the steam generators inside the containment vessel and the turbine generator. Now notice that this design is an improved design over the first design that we showed at the beginning. Uh, here are the turbines in the turbine uh, plant and the turbines rotate. If there is an accident in the turbines where a blade is ejected, it will be ejected uh, in a centrifugal way away from hitting the reactor vessel. Now let's look at the very beginning uh, a design flaw in that type of a reactor right here in Japan. This is the, the uh, turbine hall. Uh, the turbines are here if the rotation uh, uh, ejects a blade, that will, that will be hitting the reactor uh, building. But it seems that they didn't have room. Uh, they have terraced here, as you could see the mountain uh, side. So uh, they were compelled to use that design. But uh, uh, the uh, advanced PWR here by uh, Mitsubishi is a better design. And I think that should be implemented in all existing uh, power plant. But notice the 1700 megawatt uh, electric. Uh, uh, it is the world largest in its uh, class uh, using the economies of scale, even though there is a tendency to use small units, uh, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, a, com a, a collaboration between, well, it's Toshiba uh, owning Westinghouse, but Toshiba is from Japan and Westinghouse is located in the United States, uh, basically have a design that's designated as the AP-1000. The AP stands for Advanced Passive 1000 Megawatt Electric Plant. And uh, uh, this is uh, an advanced type of a design that is being built uh, 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 all over the world, except still the United States. Notice on the top here, that chimney structure on top of the containment structure and those openings there in the containment itself. In existing uh, pressurized water reactors, that containment uh, acts as a protection for the internals, as I suggested. Uh, but sooner or later, if the steam is not quenched, uh, radioactivity would be released to the environment. And that containment, uh, six feet of concrete thickness uh, reinforced concrete, uh, acts almost like an insulator against the release of the heat. So the advanced passive, uh, passive in the sense that the operators do not have to intervene is some new design feature that makes the operation of pressurized water reactors safer than the existing systems that we have. Uh, in the United States, uh, a thousand megawatt electric uh, version has been uh, 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 basically uh, 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 it, it is, uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, it, it went through the review of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they have another version, a smaller uh, version that is only 600 uh, megawatt electric. So what are the interesting features of that advanced passive PWR? Let's look at them in the diagram here. You find that the steel containment is made out of steel, and there is a gap between it and the outside uh, concrete uh, structure. You could see here back again, the steel containment right there and uh, a, the, uh, the concrete structure on the outside. 
those openings that uh, I pointed out uh, in the previous diagram from the top uh, allow air to circulate. So the air would come in down here and exit from the top using, in that case, in that big chimney-like structure, water that is would be uh, uh, dripped on the surface of the steel uh, structure. So in that case, it provides cooling to the environment uh, by generating steam if the temperature and the pressure inside the containment increased beyond a certain uh, limit. So in that case, uh, it provides cooling of that containment, but in existing reactor, the uh, containment acts more like an insulator. So it does not provide a way of dissipating the heat to the environment without the uh, active participation of the, uh, uh, the operator. As this system has been licensed so in the United States and it's being built in other countries like Thailand, uh, to my best knowledge. Another interesting, uh, uh, safety feature added to that kind of a, a design is that the uh, cooling uh, water into the pressure vessel is done with hot water into the reactor core, not with cold uh, water. Uh, if you have a hot surface, like if you have, say, a cup of glass and you pour into it uh, hot water, you can generate thermal stresses uh, that can lead to uh, the, the, the glass breaking. And one way of avoiding breaking your glass is to add maybe a spoon uh, that acts to uh, uh, dissipate uh, the heat from the uh, 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 hot water. So you don't want to pour, co pour cold water like in existing designs, uh, operating designs on a hot uh, steel uh, containment that can cause br br basically brittleness and a failure of the uh, uh, pressure vessel. So in that case, they use hot water. Uh, and in that case, uh, it is a passive uh, design. It doesn't need intervention by the operator to shut itself down. And I don't think any country should build any reactors without those safety features uh, right now. Uh, uh, not only the United States and the Russians are uh, involved in uh, newer designs for the pressurized water reactor. Uh, the Europeans, uh, uh, Framatom in France in particular, that's the name of the company, uh, has been developing what they call the evolutionary, evolutionary pressurized water reactor. They designated as EPR, 1600 megawatt electric typical uh, uh, power. Uh, some people simply change uh, the, <clears throat> the notation and call it the European uh, pressurized water reactor for the EPR. Uh, it is a generation, third generation of uh, uh, designs for uh, European uh, plants. Uh, they have a very interesting uh, feature here uh, that is not available in other designs, is that they have what they call a core catcher part of the design. Uh, in the Fukushima accent, uh, we know that part of the core of the reactor melted, and uh, they take that into account as a possibility not a probability, it's not gonna happen in all accidents, uh, but uh, they try to spread the molten core into a pool with a large surface area that would dissipate the heat basically uh, to the environment. And uh, the molten core in that case is called the corium retention uh, and an auxiliary water storage tank to uh, cool the, uh, the corium material or the molten material of the core. They call it corium because it's, uh, in the case of a serious accident, like what happened in Fukushima, and in, in fact, uh, the, the fuel melts, the uranium dioxide melts, the cladding melts, and the uh, uh, control rods also melt. So the whole mixture of that uh, uh, molten material is called the corium uh, material in the designation of accidents uh, designs in general. Uh, the Korean, uh, uh, Koreans also have their own design. They call it the Advanced Pressurized Reactor 1400. Uh, and uh, they have been very successful marketing it in uh, uh, South Korea into, uh, the, uh, into the Gulf states. In fact, uh, uh, they have sold four units and uh, two of them I think are already operating. Uh, this is 1400 megawatt electric. Uh, they notice how the uh, oil producing nations themselves are thinking about the future 
where oil would be used more like for chemical stocks, for fertilizers, transportation, but not for producing electricity in general. So South Korea also have its own design. <clears throat> there is a, a collaboration between Arriva, which is the European French, uh, the uh, uh, manufacturer and Mitsubishi from this uh, Japan design. They call it the ATMEA1, a very complex kind of uh, name. Uh, it's a collaboration between France's Arriva and Japan's uh, Mitsubishi. So the whole uh, uh, industry really is on a, an international uh, uh, level collaboration between different uh, countries. An advanced, very advanced design uh, that uh, has a very high level of safety compared to existing systems uh, is based on the design of naval reactors. And uh, uh, this is uh, a design by the General Electric uh, Company. And uh, in that case, uh, the core of the reactor uh, and the steam generators are contained inside the pressure vessel. So you don't worry in that case about any piping breaking in an earthquake and uh, uh, any steam uh, release would be contained inside the pressure uh, vessel. And uh, this is called an integral type of uh, reactor uh, designs. Uh, so they have the name IRIS for it. The reactor core and the steam generators are uh, 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 designs. As you see here, that's the core here. And that is the... <coughs> the pressurizer at the top, as well as the steam generators here. Uh, the pumps are also inside the reactor. There are eight pumps uh, for that iris design. Uh, so this uh, pressurized water reactor design is the most common one existing now in the world. And uh, it uses light water. Uh, uh, the properties of light water are known and uh, <clears throat> uh, its evolution uh, towards more safety for uh, existing uh, reactors. Uh, in essence, this is the pressurized water uh, reactor. I'll be happy to answer any question in the chat room before we go to uh, and compare the pressurized water reactor to the boiling water uh, reactor. Okay, so it's time to uh, go now uh, back uh, to the next uh, uh, design uh, uh, using light water reactor, that's a boiling water reactor. And uh, from the name itself, you'll find that the boiling water reactor now allows the water to boil inside the core of the reactor. So in that case, it doesn't need the steam uh, generators. And uh, if you uh, do not need the steam generators, uh, then the system becomes uh, more like a compact. Uh, uh, actually, it's not compact because they operate in that case at a lower pressure producing the steam. And uh, it is a competitor process to the pressurized water reactors. An example of it is the Clinton nuclear power station shown here uh, in the moonlight, the moon up in the sky here. Uh, that is 45 miles west of Champaign-Urbana here. Over the weekend, you can drive there. They have a visitor center that you can visit. Notice that it is uh, pressurized uh, uh, the containment structure here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the turbine uh, hall of the electrical island uh, constructed in a correct way where uh, the blades of the turbines cannot hit the structure like in the Ohi plant at the beginning of the previous chapter. It is cooled by an artificial coolant lake called Lake uh, Clinton uh, in that case. So, uh, uh, we are getting electricity right now uh, as we are talking on Zoom from that uh, nuclear power plant uh, at uh, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and uh, uh, it is a single uh, unit, as you could see here. It was meant to be two units. So there is a big hole in the ground awaiting maybe the utility de uh, deciding to build another unit in the future. Uh, cooling lakes are not the only way to cool a nuclear power plant and establish the flow from what we name the high temperature reservoir to the low temperature reservoir. Uh, you can use a, a lake, uh, a river, sorry. So this is a power plant here uh, using a river for cooling. And instead of uh, getting the water directly from the river for the cooling, uh, the water, some of the water is taken into what's called cooling towers. 
So the schooling towers are very, uh, an empty shell structure. I'll show you a picture from the inside of it, where the coolant, instead of uh, rejecting the water to the river itself and affecting aquatic life, uh, is uh, 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 dri dripped really uh, in a rain inside that cooling structure. As it is dripped and it's hot, uh, some the surface of the water evaporates and you get that steam uh, being released from the uh, cooling tower. This is not steam that went into the reactor core uh, whatsoever. It's, uh, it's a way of avoiding the heating uh, of the uh, river or, or the other source of water. And uh, this is a picture from the inside of that, uh, <clears throat> uh, of that cooling uh, tower. Uh, if you drive uh, close to it, uh, you could see simply the shell structure. If you get inside one of them, uh, this is what you see. This is a gentleman here taking a picture of the opening. So the water is uh, uh, dripped from the top to a pond at the bottom and the cooling occurs in, in that case. So uh, what uh, is uh, the boiling water reactor have uh, undergone lots of uh, history of uh, improvements and uh, changes in the design, all the way from designs that are called the BWR1, BWR2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now we are talking about the advanced boiling water reactor and the economic small boiling water uh, reactor. Uh, some, many of the units are in fact in the state of Illinois here. The BWR1 started in 1955 at the Dresden. Uh, this was in Illinois, Dresden 1, Dresden 2 also in Illinois. That uh, was uh, introduced in 1965 with a jet pump application. I'll talk about the jet pumps in a moment. Uh, the LaSalle plant is also in uh, uh, Illinois. It's a boiling water reactor. The Clinton plant that I mentioned is also in Illinois. You notice that Illinois is a very uh, uh, dominant kind of nuclear uh, uh, state. We have 11 uh, reactors, I think, in operation in the United States. But uh, uh, the, so the, last, the Clinton plant is one of the latest uh, versions in the design, BWR6. Uh, and uh, however, it's being uh, uh, replaced now by the advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, many of those units have been built in Japan prior to the Fukushima accident, shut down. Uh, safety wise uh, improved and then they are being restarted. Japan cannot depend on just importing natural gas and uh, they're not uh, very rich in fossil fuel like coal. So they have a large dependence on nuclear industry for their civilian applications and uh, for their uh, industry uh, in general. Uh, for uh, a smaller kind of an advanced uh, uh, version of the advanced boiling water reactor, we talk about the uh, economic small BWR. Uh, in that case, the uh, design is very safe because it does not depend on cooling for what I mentioned earlier, the decay heat from the fission products, even after you shut down the chain reaction. Uh, in that case, it has natural circulation or convection cooling. No pumps are needed in that design. You depend on what's called the chimney effect to have the system cool itself by itself. So it's a very, very safe uh, design. Uh, in essence, this is a power cycle of uh, the design that we call the BWR5 plant. Uh, you have the core of the reactor, same as the PWR, except that the control rods come in from the bottom, not from the top, like the boiling water reactor, for two reasons. One of them is that you need the, to dry the steam before you send it to the high pressure turbine, the low pressure turbine. And uh, in that case, the top of the reactor contains, because we allow boiling in that case, uh, there are no steam generators. There are still coolant pumps that uh, uh, drive what is called jet pumps. Uh, the jet pumps are pumps that don't have moving parts because they circulate the coolant <coughs> inside the pressure vessel of the reactor. Uh, another reason why we bring the control rods from the bottom is that uh, as steam forms, it creates bubbles. Uh, the density of the coolant at the bottom is higher than the density at the top. Uh, the water uh, moderates the neutrons, 
the power level is higher near the bottom than near the top. So we bring the control rods from uh, the uh, bottom. So the steam is generated in the pressure vessel itself. And uh, in that case, uh, the pressure of the uh, operational pressure is lower uh, than the pressure of the PWR. Otherwise, uh, uh, you would uh, have to make much thicker pressure uh, vessels. Uh, the BWR operates at a pressure of 1,000 PSI, pounds per square inch, absolute, compared to the 2,000 PSI of the pressurized water reactor. So the steam is produced directly inside the pressure vessel. No steam generators in that case. The steam goes to a high pressure turbine, a low pressure turbine to an electrical generator. Electricity is produced to the grid. But now uh, the water goes to a condenser uh, uh, it is condensed and it's fed into low pressure feed water heaters back into the core. It goes to the bottom and exits from uh, the top. Same as a PWR, they have a, a residual heat removal uh, heat exchanger, a pump, and, heat, uh, and uh, you have a high pressure coolant uh, injection system, a low pressure coolant injection system, but it's supplemented by an extra supply of water in what's called the pressure suppression pool. And uh, if you look at the design here, this is not a good design. Uh, in Chernobyl, they had that pressure suppression pool in their case uh, below the reactor core. Uh, the core, a part of the core melted, and that is a liquid metal. Uh, a liquid metal interacts violently with water if it's dropped into it in what's called a steam uh, explosion and the steam explosion in the Chernobyl accident uh, displaced the top of the reactor a lid of an 800 ton uh, concrete uh, slab on, uh, on the top. Uh, obviously, since you are sending the water now into the core of the reactor, it sees neutrons from the fission reaction. And there is, as a result, uh, an isotope of nitrogen is formed by the interaction of the uh, neutrons with the uh, uh, the uh, oxygen uh, molecules in the water, H2O. And uh, nitrogen-16 has a very short half-life, but it's a strong gamma emitter. So during operation, the access uh, to the reactor hall uh, is uh, limited uh, for the personnel. Well, we took our class here, the 402, for a visit. And we had dosimeters, and we walked very briefly into uh, the area of the core without really any kind of uh, uh, danger. But uh, the nitrogen 16 is, uh, limits the access uh, to the reactor uh, uh, part of the building uh, uh, during operation. And because the water goes through the uh, core, uh, you have to maintain that uh, core, uh, that water with uh, uh, basically a very, very high level of purity. Uh, so that to avoid basically a corrosion products from the piping to get activated and start generating neutrons and gamma rays for the personnel of the plant. Uh, this is a cross section through a typical BWR. The design is called the light bulb design. Uh, see here the pressure vessel inside the containment structure that looks like an inverted uh, light bulb. And uh, this would be the pressure suppression pool. In that case, it is not flat. It's uh, uh, well, better design than the previous design here where the water uh, is right under uh, the possible melting core that uh, where this molten metal can interact with the water. That is a bad design. But in that case, uh, uh, under the uh, vessel itself is what's called a, a dry well. Uh, but the pressure suppression pool is here. And if steam is generated inside the uh, containment structure, it's bubbled into uh, the pressure suppression uh, pool. Uh, now, notice something interesting in the design here. This is a turbine hall, and uh, uh, this would be in drafting the, uh, the uh, grade level. It's called the grade level. This is where the ground is. And uh, in that design at uh, Fukushima, uh, the uh, water level here, the grade level, was very close to the surface of the water. So when the uh, tsunami water from the uh, earthquake that happened there uh, filled up uh, the land, it filled up the basement of the reactor where we have a lot of safety equipment right there. And uh, 
in that case, the flooding, uh, of course, water doesn't uh, go well with electricity. Uh, this, the result was what's called a station blackout. First, the, 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 the power station itself produces uh, power for its safety uh, features, uh, but the tsunami affected a neighboring uh, uh, switchyard that was connected to the electrical grid in Japan to provide a second source of power in the case of an accident. The tsunami caused both the on-site power and the off-site power to be uh, stopped. And in that case, we had what's called a station uh, blackout. You can read more about uh, uh, the accident in the chapter on the Fukushima accident. That shows us here another cut uh, of that BWR that uh, was at Fukushima where uh, 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 pumps and uh, safety pumps, in fact, and even batteries uh, for uh, emergency operation were uh, located. So we have to be careful in the design of uh, pressurized design, uh, uh, boiling water reactors to uh, keep the area below the core as dry, the dry well of the core. Uh, another uh, feature that needs improvement is that here you have a source of water for cooling the core and the source of water is below uh, the core itself. Uh, if you would position it on top, and that was an idea by one of our students design teams, then uh, if the water heats up in the core, its density decreases, it acquires buoyancy, and you can have uh, cooling between the core and the pressure suppression pool. So uh, in, the, uh, 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 and in that case, it's very uh, similar to the small or the safe uh, uh, small BWR design that is being advocated uh, for small uh, units uh, for future uh, construction. Uh, one aspect of the uh, design of the boiling water reactor is that the control rods come in from the bottom. So if you have this is a pressure vessel here, the walls of the pressure vessel, uh, the hydraulics, the pressure of the water in the coolant itself drives the uh, control rods in and out. Uh, there is a seal there. Do you see that word seal? This is a graphite plug that plugs the uh, uh, water in the core from uh, the outside. And uh, in the Fukushima accident, that was uh, the design. The core melted and somehow the temperature melted the seal. And uh, without melting the pressure vessel itself, the reactor vessel, uh, simply the molten core leaked and interacted probably in one of the uh, units uh, with the water under the core and led to what is thought to be a monumental steam uh, explosion. Uh, the control rods uh, ex in existing uh, uh, boiling water reactors are uh, controlled by the hydraulics uh, of the water itself. So you control the pressure, uh, uh, pushes the piston in and out into RPV is the reactor pressure vessel. Uh, this is being replaced by uh, an electrical system using a linear induction uh, motor, uh, where instead of using the hydraulic pressure in the core, uh, you use uh, an electrical uh, uh, motor to drive the control rods through some kind of a helix here uh, in and out from uh, the core. So uh, this is the new design for the control rods for boiling water reactor there. Uh, of course, uh, when you use a linear induction motor, it's more uh, uh, dependable than uh, using the pressure from the core itself. Nevertheless, uh, those control rods take the shape of a cross shown here. You could see the cross. It has holes in it for cooling. And inside it, you find tubes that contains uh, neutron absorbing material. These are the tubes here you could see inside the sheath of the control rods in the shape of a cross. And uh, this cross comes in in between, uh, unlike the pressurized water reactor, which uh, have more like a spider kind of a shape that gets in between the fuel elements. <clears throat> the shape here is a cross with tubes that contains a neutron absorbing material like maybe uh, boron carbide. Boron is a very strong absorber for uh, neutrons uh, in general. And uh, in that case, the control rod comes here in between one, two, three, four fuel channels. Uh, and uh, the control rod goes up 
up and down. Uh, the same uh, configuration uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the rods for the fuel uh, is the same as the case of the PWR. All those rods here contain uranium dioxide with different enrichments. The whole thing is put together as shown right here. Let's uh, show the whole thing uh, in the pressure vessel of the boiling water reactor. The reactor core would be right that area from here to here. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the, the fuel is contained inside a, uh, 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 an inside vessel in between that inside vessel and the outside of the pressure uh, <clears throat> vessel, you have those uh, coolant pumps. Uh, these are, uh, uh, you cannot have uh, uh, parts that are moving parts inside the vessel because uh, you would need, of course, lubrication. Uh, and uh, so jet pumps are used, I'll explain their operation where, without moving parts inside the core of the react. Uh, once the steam is generated in that area right here, remember the control rods come from the bottom, uh, the steam goes to the top in uh, lots of drying equipment to send steam to now directly to the turbine. No need for the uh, steam uh, generators, no need for the pressurizer. So the capital cost would be reduced, but you operate at a lower pressure. Again, I emphasize that the containment <clears throat> What we call the containment of the uh, reactor is really the steel shell and the components that would quench any release of steam in the case of an accident. Uh, outside the steel shell, which is a containment, you find the shield building, shielding the personnel on that side from the neutron and gamma radiation and protecting the inside of the uh, component of the reactor against a direct hit uh, in fact, it's designed to take a direct hit from the Boeing 747 or a light pole uh, driven by tornado or hurricane winds at 100 miles per hour. So this is a very solid structure uh, protecting the inside of uh, the core. And we come to here the tech specs of a typical boiling water reactor. And uh, uh, it's very interesting, of course, to compare it to uh, the tech specs or the technical specifications of a pressurized water reactor. So we take a reactor of the same, almost the same, uh, uh, the same uh, power level, uh, 3,579 megawatt thermal, uh, which would uh, at the efficiency of one third would be about 1,000 megawatt electric. You notice the system pressure is 1,000 PSI only. Uh, so we operate at a lower pressure than the 2,000 PSI of the pressurized water. Uh, react. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, enrichment of the fuel, the same fuel enrichment, low enriched fuel, 2.2, 2.7. And I'm going to digress here a little bit and uh, talk about the enrichment of uh, the fuel. Uh, this is 2.2 to 2.7% uranium-235. In the pressurized water reactor, we have seen it 3 to 5%. Why is it a small uh, uh, enrichment? Well, it is an arbitrary choice uh, put together by uh, the uh, pioneer who built up the nuclear, uh, new, United States Nuclear Navy, uh, Admiral Hyman uh, Rickover. He said that, oh, we don't want uh, uh, uranium at high enrichment uh, to uh, circulate around. So he said, oh, we should stay within the three to 5% level. Uh, in contrast to, uh, Land-based reactors with that low enrichment imposed by uh, uh, Admiral uh, uh, Rickover is uh, uh, naval reactors. Naval reactors would have an enrichment of 68% or 90% uh, enrichment. Of course, uh, 60 to 90% enrichment uh, of uranium-235 can use to produce uh, nuclear uh, weapons. But the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, suggests that uh, people can uh, build research reactors uh, uh, up to the level of 20% enrichment in uranium-235. If you adopt uh, that higher enrichment, you'll have a smaller core. Hence, the capital cost would be uh, much less, uh, yet uh, there is a penalty here uh, imposed on the 
nuclear industry by some kind of a decision by uh, what amounts really to a bureaucratic kind of a decision just to keep only low level uh, fuel available, assuming that a country acquiring a nuclear reactor would separate the uranium and turn it into a weapon. The IAEA says, oh, we can go up to 20%. You cannot build a weapon with 20% enriched uranium. Uh, so I think uh, with uh, uh, newer designs of uh, 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 PWR or uh, light water reactors in general, there is no reason why we cannot go to the 20% level and have more economical system uh, than uh, competing with coal and other sources of energy. The renewables are making a head start to, uh, from nuclear energy. And uh, if you go back to the Kardashian uh, uh, scale for uh, civilizations, if you want to reach a level one civilization, uh, we need a system for producing power on earth that uh, uses uh, our natural resources, renewable sources, wind, solar, uh, hydroelectric, uh, as well as nuclear energy. Uh, we cannot depend on uh, the uh, permanence of our supplies of fossil fuels. Uh, they are depletable for the long term and they are destroying our climate uh, in that case. Uh, the core pressure drop is about 26 PSI. Uh, the active height is 148 inches. As I said, if you increase the enrichment, you can start building reactors from the experience of naval reactors that use a very high enrichment. You don't need to go to the 98% enrichment of uh, naval reactors. They're designed to overcome the xenon poisoning so that you can restart the reactor without having to wait for 24 hours, like on land-based system with the buildup of the isotope of xenon that would not let you restart the reactor until 24 hours, called the reactor dead time. And uh, some uh, naval reactors are really designed with a core that lasts for the lifetime of operation. So 20% uh, maybe uh, enrichment should be a suitable core for future designers, hopefully some among you in uh, the audience in, in general. Uh, the control rods, as I suggested, come in between four of the fuel assemblies. Uh, each one of those fuel assemblies have an array of tubes uh, using separators. Uh, and uh, each tube contains now little fuel pellets, one centimeter in diameter, stacked on top of each other. Uh, the cladding, like the PWR, is zircaloy, the alloy of zirconium. Zirconium uh, resists corrosion from the water, and uh, zirconium also has a very low absorption cross-section for, nu for neutrons. So in that case, you conserve the number of neutrons that are producing the power for you. A spring pushes those little pellets, uranium dioxide pellets. It's a ceramic that can take high temperatures, as well as it's porous, so it contains any gaseous uh, fission products. Uh, it's filled with helium. So at the manufacturing stage, you can tell whether there is a helium uh, leak when you weld the top and the bottom of the fuel rods. So same fuel as a, a pressurized water reactor, but uh, with a lower enrichment to a certain degree. As I suggested, the circulation of the water uh, in the core in the earlier designs of the BWRs uh, circulate the coolant uh, with jet pumps shown here. Uh, the jet pumps are really nozzles that have no moving parts uh, that use a differential in pressure to drive the water uh, with a pressure supplied from the outside with uh, regular uh, pumps. So let's see how those jet pumps uh, functions. Uh, there are 16 of them around the uh, periphery of the reactor core. Uh, you find here an inlet of water at high pressure, and then you have two nozzles here uh, uh, driving the water. So the high pressure from the pump outside the pressure vessel drives the water into those jet pumps. Internally, if uh, you drive the flow, uh, uh, you create an area of low pressure because you create suction here. Uh, the suction brings the water from the outside of the nozzle and uh, sends it into uh, the outlet of the nozzle. So the jet pumps here simply inject water from the pump into the nozzle and the suction is created because it creates a low pressure uh, that circulates the water inside the pressure vessel of the 
uh, boiling water reactors in operation today. Uh, however, there is a problem there in that uh, there have been problems with the jet pumps. So over time, they are being replaced in uh, newer designs with uh, what we are called uh, uh, canned rotor pumps. And the technology comes again from naval reactors. Uh, naval reactors have had uh, for naval propulsion of submarines, <clears throat> aircraft carriers, uh, be, uh, for submarine aircraft carriers have had nine generations of development, whereas land-based system have only three generations of development. So lots of experience can be adopted from naval propulsion to the civilian sector. And they have a whole chapter uh, uh, and, uh, uh, in the notes and uh, also a chapter in a textbook uh, that is published uh, along, uh, that you can read in, uh, in the notes. Uh, another interesting aspect of the boiling water reactor that doesn't exist in the PWR shown in that flow diagram here is that there is a system that would bring in feed water uh, and uh, has basically, uh, <clears throat> and has a, uh, a, a core uh, cooling uh, uh, supply. So it would, uh, the jet pumps are shown here, but that's another system that, that sprays, a core spray system that sprays the core in the case we lose the coolant from the core to cool it. Uh, some people uh, suggest that uh, it's a doubtful system to be there in existing boiling water reactors. And they point out that at Fukushima, uh, that uh, uh, a core spray system uh, spraying uh, uh, water on top of a core fuel element that are extremely hot can lead to the dissociation of the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And in fact, in the four units that uh, uh, were, uh, 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 the three out of the four units that uh, uh, were affected by the Fukushima uh, uh, earthquake and tsunami, uh, hydrogen was generated. And then that hydrogen uh, uh, was not uh, released from the containment somehow and exploded. So we had hydrogen explosions in three, actually the four units had uh, at uh, operating at Fukushima had hydrogen explosion. So that core spray system <clears throat> may have played a very major role in the generation of the hydrogen and is questionable and uh, uh, for existing as well as for future for, uh, boiling water reactors. Uh, the same way that we looked at the flow diagram of the pressurized water reactor, here we have a flow diagram of an actual boiling water uh, reactor. Uh, you could see here, we do not have the uh, pressurizer. Obviously, we don't have the steam generator. The steam is generated directly into the core, goes to the high pressure turbine, to a moisture separator, to low pressure turbine. The high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine are on the same shaft of the electrical generator bleeding occurs in the low pressure from the low pressure turbine to uh, the high pressure uh, 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 high pressure and low pressure feed water heaters uh, and uh, the end uh, expansion of the steam goes to the condenser <clears throat> all that water is combined together brought into the core not as the control rod drives come in from the bottom again uh, this is half uh, uh, the symmetric kind of configuration from both sides. And uh, uh, very importantly in the boiling water reactor is the use of uh, clean water because it gets uh, subjected by uh, to the neutron flux and uh, the isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 16 as a gamma emitter is generated. So we use a very clean water, cleaner than the water that we have in our FOSS. Again, the operation is at uh, lower pressure, 70 kilogram per centimeter squared. That's uh, uh, 1,000 PSI compared to the PWR that is operated at 2,000 PSI. That is, uh, uh, okay, let me go back to that design. Uh, that design uh, of the boiling water reactor where the core of the reactor is contained inside one single pressure vessel uh, is designated as uh, 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 a, a, a pool kind of a design because the water forms, the fuel is really in a pool of water uh, in that case. Uh, 
there is another design that uh, has been adopted uh, by uh, the old Soviet Union and Russia. And uh, in that case, instead of uh, having uh, uh, a pressure vessel for uh, the water to boil in, they have hundreds of little tubes. So it's really a, 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 a loop type of a design. Uh, the water is allowed to boil in those uh, tubes. Uh, and then uh, the mixture of water and steam is taken to those steam drums here, like in coal power plants. Uh, you bring in the water with uh, those pumps here on the side, here and here. Uh, the control rods also come in from the bottom. And uh, uh, when you bring in the mixture uh, of two phase uh, water and steam, uh, the steam exits from the steam drums from the top and goes to uh, the turbine. Uh, this is the design designated as a RBMK 1000 that was uh, act, uh, the one involved in the uh, Chernobyl uh, accident uh, in that case. The interesting thing about that design is that the water, the boiling water is separated from the moderator. The moderator in that case is graphite. All right, so we have a graphite structure here with tubes containing water that is allowed to boil and produce the steam. Now, the water in that reactor acts as a poison. So if it boils, uh, the, uh, uh, the absorption of the neutrons by the water is decreased, uh, while the moderator continues moderating uh, the neutrons. So the accident at Chernobyl was that it had what is called the po positive power coefficient of reactivity. If you allow the water to boil too much, it is equivalent to withdrawing uh, control rods. So this is a cutout of the design of the RBMK 1000 of the Chernobyl uh, fame. Uh, notice that it has a huge plug there at the top. Uh, uh, the uh, top of the core would have uh, winches that allow the refueling of the system even when it is online. So the design of the system meant it to be a dual purpose kind of a plant that they can produce plutonium for weapons in case there is a need for it on a strategic uh, purpose. Uh, reactor grade fuel uh, contains uh, isotopes of plutonium that doesn't make the reactor fuel suitable for making weapons. If you want plutonium for weapons, you need to produce the isotope plutonium 239. And that means that they had to uh, irradiate their uranium-238 for maybe no more than two weeks only uh, to avoid the production of the plutonium-240 that is not suitable for making uh, weapons-grade uh, fuel. Uh, they had the great confidence that uh, the system is going to be uh, uh, safer than the uh, pressure vessel design because one tube could fail, but not all the tubes at the same time. Uh, this is an actual view of the RBMK core uh, dueling online refueling. And if you refuel the system online, you get a high capacity factor too. It was well designed. You could see here personnel walking on top of the core while it is in operation. However, uh, well, the, the people who run it uh, uh, did not take into account the safety consideration of what is really a, uh, a separated moderator from the uh, coolant itself. And uh, they reduce the pressure of the, the uh, they reduce the pressure and the flow rate in the system uh, to test the generation of steam, ironically, to run safety equipment. And uh, the power increased suddenly. Uh, uh, and uh, we had you hear about the Chernobyl accident in Jena. Uh, the RBMK 1000 design, 1000 design, 1000 cents for 1000 megawatt electric as well as the uh, existing uh, uh, BWR up to the BWR6 design are now being replaced uh, by what's called the advanced boiling water reactor design from uh, the General Electric Company. This is a cutout of that uh, design and uh, they is designated the advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, let us uh, look at it and see if there is any critique of it. Uh, here is the grade level uh, in drafting. Uh, these are transformers outside the uh, reactor at the, uh, at the grade level. Uh, if you look at the legend here, you find that uh, 
uh, these are pumps here inside the, the uh, reactor. Uh, uh, let me see, these are, yeah, these are uh, 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 emergency uh, uh, coolant pumps that uh, are driven by diesel generators to cool the core in the case of a loss of coolant access. All right, so some people said, oh, right, uh, uh, they mistook. Uh, in the analysis of the Fukushima accident, uh, the transformers there outside the core with those uh, diesel generators that are at a high level inside the reactor. These uh, were not affected uh, directly by the accident. But look here, uh, this is the core of the reactor. This is a turbine plant, and this is the grade level. Here at the bottom of the uh, uh, reactor building, uh, there is uh, a system that runs uh, uh, a pump uh, taking steam in the case of an accident from the core and run, running the coolant uh, system. And uh, uh, that uh, pump basically and the other safety equipment was below grade level. So it was flooded by the accident at Fukushima. So in that case, uh, the General Electric Company has to uh, redesign <laughs> their advanced boiling water reactor uh, to avoid having uh, uh, any safety equipment that could be flooded in the case of a similar accident to Fukushima uh, in that case. Uh, so here is the pressure vessel of the advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, the design uh, eliminates the uh, jet pumps. You don't see the jet pumps here around the core. Still, you have the drying equipment at the top. The control rods now have been replaced from being driven by the hydraulics. Uh, pressure of the system by uh, what's called canned rotor pumps. And the canned rotor pumps is a technology taken from okay, naval reactors, where there is lots of development that could be adopted beneficially into the uh, existing uh, newer designs for a boiling water uh, reactor. Uh, this is a typical design of the advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, the source is TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power uh, company, you could see here the pumps now uh, are not the jet pumps. They are the rotor driven pumps that circulate uh, the coolant uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's a more uh, uh, suitable design. And notice here that uh, below the core, uh, the pressure suppression pool uh, 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 is away from the core. This is a dry well area under the core. So in the case of the core melting down, it doesn't you don't have water interacting with the steam. In the Chernobyl accident, uh, there was definitely an interaction between the molten core and the water, uh, they called it the water condenser under the core. And there is a suspicion also that at least one of the cores in the, Cherno uh, in the Fukushima accident, uh, there was water under the core there that caused uh, maybe also another steam uh, explosion uh, in that case. Uh, a, a bad aspect of the design is having the water below the core. As I suggested, if you, uh, uh, if you replace that location by a location above the pool, like at the fuel pool, then you can establish natural circulation cooling. The hot water will rise to the pressure suppression pool and come down and uh, you would have natural circulation without intervention by uh, the operator. All right, so this is uh, some, uh, 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 some more design here that shows us really those uh, canned rotor uh, pumps uh, used in the advanced boiling uh, water reactor, uh, replacing the jet pumps. So the design is being uh, 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 evolving uh, to newer and better designs. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, there may, may be access to the issue of the core spray and the possible generation of hydrogen that happens at uh, uh, Fukushima in general. Uh, the latest uh, ideas about the uh, uh, boiling water reactor design is what's called the economical small boiling water reactor. Uh, and uh, in that case, it's a small reactor. Uh, it doesn't produce a thousand megawatt level. You could see uh, <clears throat> that's it. Yeah, no, this is the tech specs of the uh, 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 well, it, it's still uh, 1,560 megawatt electric. I cannot call this uh, small. Uh, however, it is uh, 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 considered as small. 
And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, it eliminates totally the need for uh, the pumps. So in that case, they build the system with a very high uh, pressure vessel or low, tall pressure vessel. Uh, they can eliminate the pumps by in, uh, encouraging natural circulation. The hot water from the core rises and then comes down. And notice here that they have an attempt of putting the pressure suppression pool on top of the core. So that your circulation can also be enhanced. So uh, that system uh, has not been built so far. Uh, this is uh, the pressure vessel. Notice how tall it is. Uh, the control rods still come from the bottom, but no pumps. Uh, it uses natural convection, natural circulation to cool uh, the core. Uh, in that case, I need to use a smaller power level, but that's not what they're doing. Uh, so for the uh, economic small boiling water reactors, we are talking about an automatic depressurization system, a gravity-driven cooling system. That's the main aspect of it. It's natural convection or uh, 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 cooling uh, in general. Uh, and uh, basically, they have a passive containment cooling uh, system. Again, they show the details right here. Uh, still the pool uh, uh, is shown, but it should be shown as being above the core and the core would be lower in that case. Uh, the, it has uh, the, uh, the ESBR should be the latest design to be built. In the light bulb design that, uh, 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 at, uh, that uh, where we had the accent at uh, Fukushima, uh, is shown here. It had a depressurization uh, system with safety relief valves. Uh, these are shown here, those safety relief valves, to release the pressure from the containment. While these systems did not operate to relieve the containment pressure uh, from the hydrogen that accumulated from the uh, core spray, spraying the core and dissociating water into hydrogen and oxygen, and because they did not operate, that uh, uh, the hydrogen eventually accumulated in uh, the core. I show you. I showed you. I mentioned to you that uh, uh, pump uh, in the basement, and still uh, in the advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, this is a pump uh, that uh, uh, takes steam from the core of the reactor. In the case of an accident, you could see here it uh, the pump the 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 turbine. Uh, is fed by steam and that pump, uh, uh, the turbine runs a pump that takes water from the condensate storage tank and cools the core. Now, if that pump uh, is uh, uh, flooded, obviously uh, a safety system there is not providing cooling to the core. So the core heated up and uh, we have the, the accent at uh, Fukushima. Uh, how do we treat the problem of the hydrogen? In existing boiling water reactors, uh, hydrogen can be produced. Uh, so it has to be either released from the containment or using a sparge system uh, can uh, burn in a controlled fashion. So in that case, you get this, what's called a sparger. You get the uh, hydrogen uh, to bubble underwater and on the surface of the water, you create a flame, but maybe it's a spark plug of uh, the car engine and uh, burn the hydrogen in a controlled fashion. Obviously, this did not happen at Fukushima. Also below grade, uh, you'll find those, I had the, all this bank of batteries there uh, to provide the control system with power. Uh, and uh, that was also below grade at Fukushima. Uh, the, uh, the flaw in the design, in fact, was that they built the reactor too close to the water level. They did not take into account the possibility of a wave that could flood their safety system under uh, grade level. So if your batteries there are flooded with water, you get totally a station blackout, no power to even look at the instruments or run the safety uh, equipment. Uh, I have here a detail of uh, about the uh, generation of nitrogen 16. Uh, in the analysis of uh, boiling water reactors. I will not uh, uh, cover it, but uh, as I suggested, nitrogen 16 is a feature of boiling water reactors that limits the access to the, 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 the plant in the case of the, uh, uh, the, during operation because it emits gamma rays, but it is only 
uh, a very short half-life. Uh, and uh, because it's short half-life within a minute, say, uh, access to the third, uh, to the power plant hallway uh, can be uh, done. Uh, so this is uh, basically a comparison of the PWR and the BWR. Uh, we have time to cover the high temperature gas cooled reactor. Uh, so I'll, I'll cover that one also today. But if you have questions about the two chapters we covered today, uh, I'll be happy to answer the questions in the chat room. If not, we go to the high temperature gas cooled reactor. OK, no questions. So uh, we have to go fast over uh, the summer here. So let us uh, magnify uh, and uh, share the screen again. Uh, we have, uh, you could see here, we have quite a few different designs of reactors. The pressurized water reactor, boiling water reactors are the mainstream reactors in operation all over the world today. Uh, but uh, on the drawing board and uh, some experimental situations, we have the high temperature gas cooled reactor. So let's just look at why is it that we want to go to a high temperature gas cooled reactor. Uh, it is very obvious that the, th <laughs> the terminology tells part of the story uh, is that it's a high temperature. And uh, because it's high temperature, uh, according to the Carnot ideal cycle efficiency for thermal systems, uh, the efficiency is going to be higher. So if you think about light water reactors, the pressurized water reactor and the boiling water reactor that we cover today, uh, the cycle, the, steam, the thermodynamic cycle, the steam turbine cycle, or what's also called the joule uh, cycle. The efficiency in that case cannot exceed 35%, meaning that 65% of the energy is used to uh, uh, well, we say it's rejected to the environment, but why is it rejected to the environment? Well, to maintain that flow system that we mentioned is necessary for extracting energy from the environment uh, uh, in general. So the efficiency is low. 65% of the energy is lost. However, if we adopt the gas turbine cycle uh, or the Brayton cycle for the high temperature gas cooled reactor, we can double the efficiency of the energy that we can extract from a nuclear uh, reactor. Uh, in that case, we are using for the light water reactor steam at no more than uh, temperatures that are quite close, 300 degrees Celsius. Whereas with a temp high temperature gas cooled reactor, we can operate at temperatures at 1000 degrees uh, Celsius. Now that will show us later that uh, uh, at these high temperatures, we can uh, adopt thermochemical processes or uh, even just a plain high temperature electrolysis. Uh, the process of electrolysis uh, uh, can uh, uses electricity, but it's more uh, efficient at high temperatures where you use electricity plus heat and dissociate water into hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, why obtain hydrogen from oxygen? Because in that case, you turn your source of energy, which is uh, uh, fission energy, nuclear energy, or maybe in the future fusion energy, or it could be wind energy, or it could be solar energy into hydrogen. Hydrogen now can be used in uh, the device that we call the fuel cell. And uh, in the fuel cell, uh, the hydrogen that you would have produced uh, from uh, uh, the, the electrolysis process uh, or a thermochemical process now can be recombined back of with oxygen from the air through a, a, a small the device that we call a fuel cell. And I'll see if I can take a whole chapter on that topic because it's a, a, a competitive way to storing energy, uh, chemical energy in batteries like the Tesla cars or electrical vehicles. In that case, the energy is not stored in batteries, but the energy would be stored in hydrogen and uh, the hydrogen becomes a carrier of energy. It stores the energy from the basic uh, 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 process from nature and uh, releases it back as in the form of electricity. So it is a competitor to storing energy in chemical batteries where you store the energy as uh, hydrogen, compressed hydrogen or in a, so in a solid form or uh, uh, cryogenic form. And uh, in that case, you get electricity that can run an electric 
uh, motor and uh, in the machine called the fuel cell. So the internal combustion engine may be for transportation purposes, uh, may be replaced with uh, lithium ion batteries like uh, uh, the trend today, but there is a competition with the use of hydrogen. And uh, we'll see that hydrogen can uh, store much more energy than chemical batteries. Hence, uh, a competition is arising between say Tesla and uh, um, General Motors and uh, Toyota uh, in Japan. Japan uh, has dedicated itself to using fuel cells, especially because it can store much more energy than uh, chemical batteries uh, for trucks for, and for long distance uh, transportation. So the high temperature gas cooled reactors may be in our future just to implement the fuel cell approach to uh, generate uh, 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 storing energy, transforming energy from uh, nuclear fission or maybe fusion uh, into the uh, transportation uh, system. And in addition, look at this, it's doubly uh, more efficient than the light water reactor. So high temperature gas cooled reactors are uh, part of our future. In fact, you can operate that uh, uh, type of a cycle by using a gas cooling uh, for at very low temperature to produce just process heat. Uh, many countries in Europe uh, use process heat delivered to homes uh, using natural gas uh, today. Uh, you can use still the Brayton cycle for power generation uh, if you operate in the range of 250 to 600 degrees Celsius. Again, at the very high efficiency right here, but if you want the hydrogen production, well, you need to operate it at the 950 or 1000 degrees Celsius. The coolant could be a helium, it could be carbon dioxide, it could be nitrogen, as long as it is a gas. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there have been pilot plants uh, operated in the United States uh, that used uh, high temperature gas cooled reactors. Uh, one of them operated uh, 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 up to 1974 at Peach Bottom. Uh, in the UK, they have a dragon plant operated until 1975. Germany had two designs, the, uh, uh, the thorium heated uh, uh, high temperature reactor, thorium high temperature reactor, it operated in 1985. And the United States had another power plant at Fort St. Vrain, Colorado, operated until 1976. One fascinating feature of these gas turbine type of uh, Brayton cycle plants is that they also used thorium uh, as a uh, breathing material. So uh, they started burning uranium-235. Uh, they produced uh, uh, neutrons. Uh, they absorbed the neutrons. Look here. The fuel was a mixture of thorium and uranium. Thorium, 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 thorium. So that was an introduction to using the thorium cycle. Thorium uh, uh, in the Earth's crust is four times more abundant than uranium. So in that case, it provides us with not only a more efficient system in terms of higher temperature operation, uh, but it provides us also with a longer term source of, of uh, energy from nature uh, in general. The fuel type uh, uh, designs, as uh, we'll see in a moment, uh, uh, in the latest design at Fort St. Brain, they use hexagonal blocks of graphite. Graphite can take very high temperatures. That's why it is used in that design. And uh, it reached really the level of 330 megawatt uh, electric. It operated successfully uh, in the United States, but had, had a problem in the turbine plant. So they uh, simply uh, converted it into burning coal, uh, a big mess. Uh, the uh, high temperature uh, thorium uh, uh, reactor operated uh, in Germany. Uh, it used a different concept for the uh, cooling. It was a pebble bed sphere. So I'll describe to you uh, the design of what is a pebble bed type of a design. All of them used helium as a coolant. And uh, the temperature, as you could see here, uh, that can be attained is not the 350 degrees of light water reactors. Here we're talking about 950 degrees Celsius. Hence, uh, we can use the thermochemical processes or high temperature electrolysis to produce the hydrogen. So this is an actual picture of the peach bottom plant uh, in uh, 
40 megawatt electric. Uh, so it was built as a pilot plant. It used thorium. <coughs> That's a pilot plant uh, in the UK. All of this uh, gas cooled reactor use thorium. This is a Ford Sandvrain reactor. And here I show you uh, the how the fuel and the moderator are composed. They're placing here those hexagonal kind of uh, 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 parapipide, I would say. And if you look very closely, you find like that there are holes in that uh, uh, graphite block. As I said, graphite can take high temperatures, and this is being lowered in the core of the Fort and Brain uh, reactor. Uh, I'll describe to you the concept of the uh, hexagonal parapipide. Uh, what uh, and uh, this is in contrast to another system that uses very small kernels of uh, uranium dioxide. And then you cover them with several layers of pyrolytic graphite or pyrolytic carbon. And then you place silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is really the material used uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the surface of the reentry vehicles uh, for the space shuttle. It can take very high temperatures and uh, a third layer of pyrolytic graphite. So in that case, the fuel is enclosed in one, two, three layers of protection against any release of the fission uh, product. This could be the size of one millimeter here, uh, very small, the almost uh, salt grains. You place them in a larger matrix of graphite in the shape of a ball, uh, that would be six centimeters in diameter, the size of a tennis uh, ball. So this is the, uh, another concept that we call the pebble bed design. So. Uh, the size, as I suggested, of a, a tennis ball. And then in that case, you fill up the reactor core, uh, not with those uh, uh, parapipide blocks of graphite, but with balls of the, uh, uh, that the graphite containing the thorium. So what do you do? You feed those balls from the top of the reactor. And as the fuel is consumed, you uh, simply extract them from the bottom of the reactor. So it becomes an online system continuously uh, operating. The coolant comes in from the bottom and cools them, and the spent fuel is extracted from uh, the bottom. It's also an in integral type of a design by in the design built in Germany, the THTR, in that you have a whole pressure vessel with steam generators in the center. Now, that was a bad <laughs> design, because here you are uh, using a gas cooled system so what do you do? You have to use the gas turbine design. You would place a compressor on the same shaft as the uh, turbine uh, that produces the power for you. But those guys went and uh, used a, a gas cooled system and then turned it into a steam generation. So that's why probably the whole system failed because it didn't uh, really uh, use uh, adequately the laws of uh, physics. What was an advancement uh, is that the uh, cooling towers uh, that they tried on the THTR were not the water cooled towers, one of them shown here, but was a metallic structure. So the rejection of the heat to the environment was from the metallic surface of that cooling tower. What does it mean? It means that you don't need water. You don't need makeup water that turns into steam from a lake or from a river. So that type of a system uh, would be suitable for desert areas where you don't have water. Uh, where you can place your nuclear power plant. So arid regions of the world can uh, reject the heat through uh, those cooling towers. So that was a successful part of it, but definitely uh, using a steam cycle with a gas coolant uh, uh, was not really the uh, right idea to do. If you use the gas cooled, you use the Brayton cycle and the gas turbine cycle. All right, so people have put uh, as a, uh, newer designs, the pebble bed modular reactor. And uh, this uh, was designed by actually in South Africa. And in that case, when you use a pebble bed modular reactor, you use uh, here, you could see here that you have now a turbine and the compressor on the same shaft. So that is a Brayton cycle. Uh, the clay, the uh, Clinton plant next to us has, as I suggested, a big hole in the ground that at some point, some people suggested should be filled with one of those uh, gas turbine plants uh, uh, with high efficiency in general. And uh, uh, 
the pebble bed modular reactor has a very interesting safety features and it could be the basis uh, of uh, producing uh, 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 hydrogen uh, as a fuel for a future transportation uh, system. Uh, just that uh, there are two reactors in the world uh, today, pilot plants, one in Japan and one in uh, China at Tsinghua University. Uh, the high temperature engineering test reactor is a 30 megawatt thermal and it uses a prismatic design like the same way as uh, what was used at the, uh, uh, here in the United States, uh, uh, in Colorado. So you could see the prismatic uh, uh, graphite with holes in it. Some of the holes contain the fuel, uh, uranium dioxide or uh, uranium carbide or nitride that can take even higher temperatures. And then you have holes where you circulate your helium uh, coolant. So that's a reactor designed for uh, the future. Uh, and it's also even placed underground. The HDR-10 uh, is a pilot plant at uh, Tsinghua University in China, but this one now uh, uses the pebble bed design. So these are two designs for the future where we can get very high temperatures. And uh, I'll stop here. And next time we'll try to cover a chapter on why is it that we need to use nuclear energy or solar energy or wind energy to store energy in hydrogen for a future non-polluting. Because once you use the hydrogen in a fuel cell, oh, what do you get? You get water back again from the water that you started with. So that's a zero carbon approach. So I'll leave this for the next lecture and I'll go again and uh, if necessary, the whole afternoon answering questions and the rest of the class is dismissed at that point if you don't have questions in the chat room. Have a nice day, everybody. Uh, we stop recording here.